Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, a new species of Siberian dinosaur has been discovered, a prehistoric arachnid with incredible spiny legs has been found, the cellular structure of fossilised dinosaur skin has been described, and much more. Starting off the news this week, a study has come to the conclusion that Yersinia pestis can be transmitted from one human to another via lice bites. Yersinia pestis is the bacteria that causes the plague, a disease that has famously caused some of the worst plagues in history, including the Plague of Justinian and the Black Death. It has usually been believed that the plague was spread largely by fleas that were in turn carried by rats. This has been questioned a few times before, with some claiming that the plague has spread too quickly during events like the Black Death to be just the work of rats and fleas. It is rather difficult to say for sure though, as a lack of comprehensive records on the exact spread and casualty toll of pandemics from so long ago mean we can't get an accurate measurement of exactly how deadly these were. However, this new study has proved that lice could spread the disease as well, giving us a new insight into how the plague may have spread hundreds of years ago. This isn't a completely new idea though, and had previously been discounted because it was believed that lice were too inefficient at transferring the disease to have any major effect in its spreading. This study has discovered that some body lice can develop an infection of Yersinia pestis on the Poloski glands. What these glands do specifically, we're not entirely sure, but it is believed that they probably help in salivary lubrication of some of the parts of the lice's mouth. If these Pawlowski glands do get infected, then the study found that the lice transmit the disease far more effectively than previously had been observed and therefore could indeed be responsible for higher rates of transmission in historical outbreaks of the plague. A very interesting study that once again utilises the science of today to try and help us explain some of the mysteries of our own past. In other news, we're sticking with the past as we head back to the ancient Neolithic settlement of Chateauhayuk in modern day Turkey, a place we actually talked about a few weeks ago when some of the oldest bread ever was discovered there. It was lucky that we didn't mention the estimates for the population of the town as a study this week, published in the Journal of Anthropological Archaeology, has re-evaluated the amount of people they believe to have been living there at its peak. The population estimates have usually been in the thousands, sometimes being as large as 10,000, but this recent study calls this a significant overestimate and instead puts the population between 600 and 800 people during an average year, between 6,700 and 6,500 BC. The study used the latest models of the distribution of the residential buildings of the settlement and argued that previous estimates have assumed a greater population density than would be likely. This new research argues that residential buildings were not fully inhabited at the time and indeed that around 30% of the buildings in the settlement usually didn't have anyone living in them. This isn't just an interesting look at one particular town, this new population estimate challenges the hypothesis that very high growth forced rapid migration and an acceleration of the Neolithic way of living, as these ideas were more quickly spread throughout the land. It seems that this study is part of a wider growing scholarship that has suggested that the transition from Neolithic farming villages to larger proto-cities took much longer than previously thought. It will be interesting to see how future studies react and whether this will become the prevailing idea or not. Up next, the plight of Bella, the beluga whale, has been highlighted in the news this week. Sadly, Bella has been in a tank on her own for the past five years. She lives in Seoul, in the shopping centre beneath the Lot World Tower, which is owned by one of South Korea's largest conglomerates. She was captured in 2013 at the age of two from the Arctic Ocean off the coast of Russia, along with two male beluga whales. The male Bello died in 2016 at the age of five and the other, Belly, died in 2019 at the age of 12. In the wild, their lifespan is 35 to 50 years of age. After Belly died, Lottie pledged to release Bella, but so far that has not happened. The delay was in part due to COVID, but there is now no such excuse. 
Belugas are very intelligent social animals and in the wild, Bella would be surrounded by her family. Stuck in her tiny glass tank on her own, she is deprived of any stimulation and spends her days spinning aimlessly around and floating motionless and according to experts, is showing signs of mental illness. Unfortunately, if she were to be rescued from her tank, she would not be able to go back into the wild. She does not have the skills, such as hunting, to survive. She would have to go into a sanctuary, such as the one in Iceland, where two other beluga whales from a Chinese aquarium are living successfully. Other sanctuaries are planned in Norway and Canada. South Korea has now banned the buying of whales and dolphins for display, which is great news, but something needs to be put in place for those who remain in captivity so that they can live out the remainder of their lives peacefully and happily. It's been a good week for new dinosaur species, as two new theropods have been named in the last seven days. First up, a new kind of ceratosaur has been discovered in Western Siberia, dating to the early part of the Cretaceous period around 121 to 113 million years ago. It's been named Kia Cursor Longapes, which translates to long-legged runner of the river Kia. It's known from a partial skeleton, including vertebrae from the neck and tail, plus parts of the forelimbs, fairly complete hind limbs, and some ribs. Ribs. The proportions of this dinosaur's legs and its light build indicate that it was probably a very fast runner, and it's been found to be related to some other speedy theropods, belonging to a group called Noasaurids. Noasaurids are abelosaurs, and are a part of one of the major radiations of theropod dinosaurs called Ceratosauria. Interestingly though, Ceratosauria, despite being very widely distributed throughout the older Jurassic period, seem to have been displaced from the northern continents by other groups of dinosaurs during the Cretaceous, and continue to diversify, but only on the southern continents. Kia Cursor, being found in the early Cretaceous of Siberia, therefore actually extends the known record of this group on the continent by a whopping 40 million years, after they were thought to have disappeared from here. The ancient ecosystem that Kia Cursor was a part of also includes other examples of Jurassic relics that survived into the Cretaceous period, such as salamanders, other types of reptiles, and even some early mammalia forms. The paleontologists therefore refer to this apparent refuge in Western Siberia as a real Jurassic Park, where survivors from the period lived on far longer than in other places across the planet. The other new dinosaur of the week is actually another abelosaur, this time from Patagonia and dating to the end of the Cretaceous period between 72 and 66 million years ago. It's been named Colaken in Akayali, with Colaken derived from a name in the Tushan language spoken by the native people of central Patagonia, which means coming from clay and water. A great descriptor for this dinosaur as its bones were found in a section of rock mainly made up of clay stones deposited by an ancient estuary. In Akayali, meanwhile, honours one of the last chiefs of the indigenous Tewelche people of Patagonia. Colacan is known from associated but jumbled up series of bone pieces comprising the skull, vertebrae, hip, tail and hind limbs. The new species was recovered from the La Colonia formation, which also was home to Carnotaurus, another abelosaurid, as well as the small titanosaur Titanomachia, which we reported on a few episodes ago. Although Colacan is quite similar to Carnotaurus, there are still many differences in their bones, indicating that this ancient ecosystem was home to two large abelosaurid predators, and so life for poor little Titanomachia would probably have been quite terrifying. Some fantastic abelosaur discoveries this week then. Next up, paleontologists have also discovered a new species of prehistoric arachnid and called it Doug. Well, almost. It's been named Douglas Arachne Acanthopoda, not after our Doug, but after the Douglas family who donated the fossil specimen to the Field Museum in Chicago. This amazing new species was uncovered in the 308 million year old Mason Creek Lagerstatter of Illinois, and was immediately recognised as a new species due to the distinctive large spines on its legs. The function of these spikes was presumably to deter predators from making a meal of it, by making it more unpleasant to bite. Remarkably, despite its appearance, Douglas Arachno is not a spider. Paleontologists are actually not entirely sure what it is and classify it as an uncertain position within a massive arachnid grouping that also includes all spiders, whip scorpions and various extinct lineages. Douglas Arachno therefore adds to the known diversity of arachnids that lived during the Carboniferous period, which were incredibly varied in their anatomies and include lots of body plans not seen today 
as a lot of these prehistoric arachnid lineages were wiped out by the Carboniferous rainforest collapse and the later great dying mass extinction event. Hopefully more fossils of this amazing creature will help us to understand just what exactly Doug is. I still don't know. <laughs> is he cardboard? Is he human? There's also been a very interesting study published this last week investigating the origins of bird warm bloodedness as well as which non-bird dinosaurs were warm or cold-blooded. This research used evidence from the fossil record along with models of dinosaur evolution and ancient climatic conditions to look at how dinosaurs diversified and spread across the planet, discovering some interesting patterns that suggest they are related to the animal's metabolic rates. The theropod and ornithischian dinosaurs were found to have diversified across broader climatic landscapes than the sauropods, with a trend towards cooler niches. Sauropods pods, however, show a prolonged climatic conservatism, generally sticking to warmer climates. This therefore seems to suggest that theropods and ornithischians were endotherms and generated their own body heat, like modern birds and mammals, allowing them to move into colder regions, whereas sauropods were potentially poikilotherms, with variable body temperatures dependent on the environment. These are interesting results and seem to contrast with previous studies that found sauropods to be likely warm-blooded. Theropods were found to have shifted to inhabit colder climates in the early Jurassic, indicating warm-bloodedness had evolved in these dinosaurs pretty early on in their evolution. So some very interesting results. And finally for the news this week, Paleontologists have investigated the cellular structure of preserved skin in the dinosaur Cetacosaurus. They looked at a juvenile specimen of this small ceratopsian species from northeastern China, which is almost entirely preserved in a belly-up position. Although at first glance it seems like no soft tissues are preserved, under UV light, patches of mineralized tissues can be seen on the torso and along the limbs. The structure of these skin patches was found to be consistent with the original scales having been rich in corneous beta proteins instead of alpha keratins, like what we see in the feathered skin of birds. Additionally, the distribution of the pigment-bearing melanosomes is consistent with melanin-based coloration in living crocodilians. Taken together, the study says that this indicates a partitioning of skin development in the dinosaur dinosaur, with a reptile-type condition in these scaly parts of the body, but a more avian-like condition along its tail where bristle-like filaments grow. Another interesting find was the observation that the outer layers of the scales along the underside of the body were thinner compared to modern quadrupedal reptiles, as the bipedal Cetacosaurus wouldn't have needed the extra thickness for protection as it was off the ground. So lots of fascinating discoveries from this analysis of an absolutely amazing dinosaur fossil. Well, that's it for the news this week. I hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. Also, be sure to go follow our TikTok and Instagram accounts if you like for more paleontological news updates and short form videos about various extinct animals. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time. Paleontologists have investigated the cellular structure of preserved skin in the dinosaur Pistacosaurus. <laughs> Pistacosaurus. <laughs> oh my god. Cetacus. Why the hell is it spelled like that? <laughs> I don't do dinosaurs. Cetacosaurus. <laughs> and finally, for the news this week. <laughs>